In our first 10 sessions, we focused exclusively on the background to the war and the actual combat in the European theater. In the winter of 1941, the nature of war would change from a European war into a global conflict. In this lecture, we want to shift our attention to, to Asia, to the diplomatic background to the conflict in Asia, to a discussion of Japanese, the Sino-Japanese conflict, which had begun in many ways in 1931, had certainly become a major war by 1937, so in advance of events in Europe, to analyze the strategic dilemma of the Japanese leadership in this period, the late 30s, and in the final period before the decision to attack Pearl Harbor. And then finally, the deterioration of relations between the United States and Japan in 1941. We'll begin with some background about the strategic position of Japan. The Japanese had emerged from the first war as a victor state, having helped to capture German concessions in China and having seized the Marshall, Mariana, and Caroline Islands in the Pacific, all of which had been German possessions. At the negotiations at Versailles, Japan was rewarded with the former German concessions in the Shantung area and on the Yellow Sea, despite vehement Chinese protests and expressions of disgust from the United States. At the Washington Naval Conference in 1921-1922, Japan had agreed to limits on naval construction, which left it in an inferior position to the United States and Great Britain. The Japanese had agreed to limit the size of its fleet to three-fifths the size of the British and American fleets. And the Japanese also appeared to recognize Chinese territorial integrity. These concessions rankled many junior naval and army officers in Japan who were resentful of what they considered to be Western arrogance and were increasingly influenced by extreme nationalist ideas that were sweeping the country. Many were convinced that Japan's future security could be assured only through the seizure of raw materials, food and oil in particular, and that such seizures would ultimately have to come through military conquest. Jap Japan was also experienced experiencing at this time a population explosion which uh, exacerbated problems of overcrowding, of unemployment and poverty in Japan, and a, a growing disgust with the civilian government which military leaders saw as, at any rate as racked with scandal and corruption. These military leaders believed that Japan's salvation lay in expansion, particularly on the Asian mainland where China but especially Manchuria offered a particularly enticing target. Manchuria was rich in natural resources and since 1905, influence over this northern region of China had been split between Russia and Japan. Japan had military garrisons in the southern part of Manchuria, but the region was largely regarded as a virtual wilderness where a Chinese warlord uh, claimed control. It was seen as territory ripe for the taking by the Japanese. Then in 1931, middle grade officers of the Kwantung Army, the Japanese military force stationed in Manchuria, manufactured what they called an incident, in quotation marks, on the South Manchurian Railway near Mukden. Within hours, a full scale attack on Manchuria was underway. While the civilian government in Tokyo vacillated, the Kwantung army seized Manchuria in a few months, establishing the puppet state of Manchukuo under Japanese protection in 1932. The Japanese civilian government was unable to restrain the army and was forced to defend its actions in the international community. The League of Nations, for its part, condemned Japanese actions in Manchuria in the Japanese, for their part, withdrew from the League of Nations. Condemnation of Japanese actions in Manchuria attracted uh, worldwide disapproval, but was that disapproval was particularly sharp in the United States, where a strong interest in China uh, had uh, traditional roots. The nominally sovereign Nanking government, Chinese government, was unable to master the situation. 
torn by battles between rival warlords, especially since 1927, and a civil war also against the communist Chinese under Mao. China seemed to be coming apart at the seams. Not only did it offer rich ma uh, mineral resources, food also for the Japanese, but it, China itself at this, in this period seemed to be something of a crazy quilt of, of territories held together by warlords who fought with one another, ideal for the taking. It was a situation that the Japanese hoped to exploit. In 1937, China, the, the Japanese asked China to join a tripartite pact with Japan and Manchukuo aimed at the Soviet Union and to allow five of its northern provinces to be transformed by the Japanese into a buffer zone against potential Soviet expansion. The Japanese were quite concerned about Russian influence in Manchuria and in the Far East, uh, and this is exactly where these two great powers, the Soviet Union and Japan, would come into potential conflict. The Chinese refused to sign on to this Japanese alliance plan, and after a series of incidents, full-fledged war broke out in July of 1937. Although the Japanese government continued to refer to its actions there as the, quote, China incident, the Japanese had, in fact, embarked upon an aggressive expansionist war. In July 1937, Japanese units, army units, moved into northern China from Manchukuo. The Soviet Union signed at the same time an agreement the so Sino-Soviet non-aggression pact with the Chinese, and the Chinese communists announced in September that they would support Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek in his war now against the Japanese. So Soviet intervention, you have a Chinese civil war going on, uh, which now is put in abeyance, a situation that is verges on the chaotic, but with the Japanese certainly attempting uh, to exploit this. By November 1937, Japan occupied Shanghai, and in December besieged the, capital city, the new capital city of Nanking. In six weeks, the city of Nanking would finally fall uh, in December, on December 12th. And in the following period, into January of 1938, Japanese troops engaged in widespread executions, rape, and the random murder of civilians. In what came to be known as the Rape of Nanking, the Japanese, uh, this, these Japanese atrocities, which were widely documented, widely covered in the press, marked a dramatic ex escalation uh, in the massacre of civilians which had accompanied the Japanese military operations in China. The totals are vague, but the conservative estimates are that about 200,000 people died, Chinese civilians died, in this rape of Nanking. Some of the most famous photographs of the Second World War uh, stem from precisely this period. There is a, uh, that photograph, famous photograph of a, of a small child, almost an infant, sitting alone in the middle of a railroad track with smoldering buildings and wrecked tr uh, railroad cars behind it. Uh, almost smoke, the child almost itself uh, uh, smoking um, is from this period and it att attracted tremendous attention, particularly in the United States. Reports from China, photographs of burning cities, of dead children, startled the international community, but as I said, especially here in the United States where the China lobby was particularly strong and vocal. Outrage at Japan was widespread. At this point, Chiang Kai-shek moved the capital to Chongqing in the interior, and then in October of 1938, Canton fell. In December of 1938, the United States, in a desperate attempt to shore up Chiang Kai-shek's regime to maintain Chinese resistance to the Japanese, the United States extended a loan of $25 million to the Chinese government. This is a fairly remarkable thing at the time, actually, if you think about it, where the Europeans were very much concerned about American isolationism, that the United States seems readier to, in, to become involved in the Far East than in, in Europe itself. Japanese policy between 1936 and 1940 was dominated 
by a compromise agreement between the Army and the Navy and embodied in a document entitled Fundamental Principles of National Policy. This document was drafted in, in August of 1936. There had been a debate within the Japanese military. And the military by this point had clearly come to dominate the civilian government in Japan. The Japanese army saw Japan's great nemesis, its great enemy, as the Soviet Union, and constantly pressed for new appropriations to, to reinforce the position of the army, to build up the army to fight a land war against the Soviet Union in Manchuria or in the north. The Japanese Navy, on the other hand, tended to emphasize the the ripe fruits to be taken by an expansion to the south. Through Southeast Asia, the colonial possessions of Europe, Indochina, Malaya, the Dutch East Indies, possibly the Philippines, and hence the debate tended to focus around this notion of a northern strategy or a southern strategy. The north tended to be emphasized by the army, the southern by the navy. But this fundamental principles of national policy, which was drafted in August of 1936, was a compromise. It called for Japan to secure, quote, a firm diplomatic and defensive position on the East Asiatic continent. What did that mean? It meant China. To establish itself in China. And, quote, the extension of national influences to the South Seas. This is the bow to, to the Navy. The document insisted that advances in the South were to be accomplished, and I quote again, gradually and by peaceful means, close quote, and that in the North, caution should be exercised to avoid confrontation with the Soviet Union. At the same time, both the Army and Navy were to be greatly strengthened to a level at which they could, and I quote again, resist the forces of the Soviet Union, and the Navy should be expanded to a level sufficient to secure command of the Western Pacific against the U.S. Navy." Close quote. Although st stated cautiously, this program in 1936 was quite dangerous. It saddled Japan, it committed Japan to an arms race with the Soviet Union and the United States. It called for, no matter how mildly it was stated, for an expansion into China. It was going to bring Japan into conflict with the Soviet Union if Japan moved to the north, and the southern route would certainly lead to trouble with Great Britain, France, and the United States. The German victory in the west in the summer of 1940 had a dramatic effect on Japanese strategic thinking. The moderate government, civilian government, was finally toppled and replaced by a, in July of 1940, with a far more aggressive uh, cabinet that, whose goals were, first of all, to establish some sort of alliance with the Axis powers. Japan and Germany clearly were the wave of the future, and some sort of alliance with Germany would be the key uh, foreign connection for the Japanese. This new Japanese government in July of 1940 also was determined simply to crush China. There would be no compromise on this. Now the, it was the question of seizing what one wanted in China, pursuing the war to its ultimate conclusion. And third was the, a push to the south. The collapse of France, the, the occupation of Holland by the Germans, the defeat of Britain. It was clear, wasn't it, that, that England was defeated. All of these things made this southern strategy, this move into Southeast Asia, very, very attractive to Japanese policymakers. French Indochina, British Malaya, the Dutch East Indies, uh, all the Dutch East Indies with their tremendous oil deposits, rubber in Indochina, rice, all of these things were important for the Japanese, and now with the defeat of precisely these powers in Europe, this was clearly the way to go. In addition, this new Japanese cabinet wanted to, domestically, to install, quote, a new political structure, as they called it, to silence the opposition. The leading figure in this new cabinet was the Minister of War, a military man by the name of Tojo. So, in July of 1940, the Japanese government seized opportunities 
and is, is determined to take a more aggressive tact in its foreign policy. The most important feature of Japanese foreign policy was the situation in China. Despite the great victories over the Chinese since 1937, Japan, for example, held most of coastal China and the most important inland cities already by 1940, they continued, the Japanese continued to face resistance from Chiang Kai-shek, supported by Britain, France, and the United States. We were sending financial support, uh, materiel, and so on. And, of course, they were the, there were the Chinese communist guerrillas who, when they weren't fighting Chiang Kai-shek, decided to fight the Japanese. There was a, a strange situation that was already emerging and would remain through all the way through the war, which is one was never quite sure exactly what the fronts were. I don't mean the geographical fronts, but the political fronts. We support Chiang Kai-shek so that he will fight the Japanese. But Chiang Kai-shek is just as interested in fighting the Chinese communists under Mao as he is the Japanese. The Japanese want to defeat Chiang Kai-shek, but they also have the Chinese communists to deal with. And so this was the situation, the diplomatic situation that one found oneself in in 1940. A move to the south against French, Dutch, and English colonies would help resolve the Chinese conflict for the Japanese, Tojo felt. Japan estimated that in 1940, about 41% of the outside supplies reaching China came via Haiphong Harbor in French Indochina. 31% came from India across the Burma Road. 19% by coastal waters, that is Hai, uh, Hong Kong, and 2% over the land route from the Soviet Union. So, the seizure of the Dutch East Indies Indonesia today, would provide needed oil that would be lost if the United States, as anticipated, imposed economic sanctions. So, an, a move to the south would not only provide new raw materials for Japan, much needed raw materials, but would also help to cut this, the Chinese knot, uh, as they sometimes put it, that it would close off the supply routes to Chiang Kai-shek and the Chinese. What this required was some sort of arrangement with the Soviet Union. The Japanese now became interested in a non-aggression pact with the Soviets, but what it really required was preparation for a conflict with the United States. The Japanese hoped to avoid it, but they were unwilling to give up a push to the south. The Japanese by this point are already very seriously contemplating and begin to plan a strategic offensive that would take them into Indochina, Malaysia, the Dutch East Indies. Of course, just to the east of those, one visualizes the map, is the Philippines, with the American position in the Philippines. And so one option was to, be to, was to move through Southeast Asia and leave the American position alone. Don't attack the Philippines. But if you do that, you're exposing all of your operations to the potential attack from the United States from its Philippine bases. It's interesting, and I think, um, prophetic. Naval map exercises were held in Japan in May of 1940. War games conducted by the naval uh, chief of operations. Th those map exercises revealed that for a very short time, a matter of months, possibly even a year, in a potential conflict with the United States, Japan would be tremendously successful. But if the conflict went beyond that, if the United States were not knocked out of a a conflict within a matter of months, then over the long haul there were grave potential difficulties for Japan. In other words, those map exercises suggested that a war with the United States was a great strategic gamble. Nonetheless, a decision to pursue this course was officially approved at, the, at a conference, a Japanese government conference in July of 1940, that is to pursue this southern strategy, even if it ran the risk of conflict with the United States. The Japanese were determined to cut off supplies reaching Chiang Kai-shek. This was a major goal. And in July, the Japanese demanded for the British to close, 1940, to cl for the British to close down the Burma Road. The British didn't want to do this. They wanted to continue to support Chiang Kai-shek, 
but now it's July 1940. The British have bigger worries on their mind than what's going on uh, out in Burma and on the frontier with China. And so the British looked to us, looked to the United States. Would the United States support Great Britain if Britain resisted this Japanese demand to close off the Burma Road? The Roosevelt administration reluctantly had to say, well, no, we won't support you. We can't do that. This would, call, this would run the administration into trouble with Congress. We wouldn't support Great Britain in an act of defiance, but the United States, in response to this Japanese demand, announced a limited embargo on the export of scrap iron, steel, and certain grades of aviation fuel to Japan. Then in September of 1940, the Japanese formally entered the so-called Tripartite Pact with Germany and Italy. This was the link to the Axis in Europe. Tojo believed that this linkage of Japan with the Axis in Europe would deter American interference, that the Americans wouldn't want to be drawn into a conflict with Japan, especially if it meant a linkage to, to the Italians and the Germans. This agreement, this tripartite pact, called on each signatory to come to the aid of any other signatory involved in war with a power not currently at war in Europe. This is clumsy diplomatic language, but what this really basically meant was the United States. It could have meant the Soviet Union when the, when the pact was signed, but it certainly meant the United States. If Tojo hoped that what this would do was deter the United States, it produced, he was disappointed. It produced exactly the opposite effect in Washington. The United States offered support to the Dutch. If the Dutch would refuse to enter into long-term contracts to supply Japan with oil from the Dutch East Indies, and FDR pushed through additional loans to China amounting to $70 million. In October, the British reopened the Burma Road and Great Britain, the Netherlands, and Australia began talks, mutual defense talks, about possible reactions to Japanese aggression in Asia. In April, in March of 1941, rather, the United States passed the Lend-Lease Act and made provisions which would allow us to provide additional support to Chiang Kai-shek in China. In April of 1941, then, Japan entered into an agreement with the Soviet Union, the so Japanese Soviet Non-Aggression Pact. Japan and the United States, this, this pact, this J Japanese Soviet Non-Aggression Pact, is interesting. What it did was to show that Japan and the United States were inching toward a real military confrontation. The Japanese had clearly decided on a southern strategy, not confrontation with the Soviet Union, but a push into Southeast Asia. In 1941, Japanese-American relations continued to deteriorate. One could see the storm clouds forming. Japan felt threatened by American economic sanctions and unhappy about American aid to China. In May, the Japanese government made new proposals to the United States for improving relations. If the United States would halt its aid to the Chinese and resume normal American-Japanese trade, the Japanese would vacate China within 25 years. This was an offer that the Americans felt they had to refuse. But Ro President Roosevelt kept the negotiations going. He wanted to continue to engage the Japanese in discussions, hoping to avert forcing the Japanese into aggression, to continue to talk, to continue to negotiate. While these negotiations were underway, of course, Germany launched Operation Barbarossa, its invasion of the Soviet Union, without, I might add, Japanese foreknowledge. The Japanese-German connection is just that. It's a connection. It is not a military alliance. It is not even really much of a political alliance. They acted independently, and the Japanese were certainly not privy to German calculations about an invasion of the Soviet Union. Like virtually everyone else, the Japanese assumed a quick German victory. They reinforced Japanese troops in the north, in Manchuria, but clearly had decided to move south. Still, the Japanese government hoped to acquire what it wanted by diplomatic means. But if the United States or the West could not be brought to reason, then so be it. <laughs>
Japan would be prepared for war. It would seize what it had to have. When the Japanese sought and received permission to send troops into Indochina from the French, who were in no position to resist at this point. The French still had their, their empire. This is something the Germans had allowed them. It put Japan within easy striking distance of the Dutch East Indies, Malaya, Singapore, and the Philippines. President Roosevelt knew also because of the American breaking of the Japanese code. This was called magic in the Pacific. The United States knew that military preparations were already underway. That is, the Japanese, while continuing to negotiate, were making military preparations for a move into Southeast Asia. If the negotiations came to nothing, then Japan wanted to be ready. We, the civilian government in the United States, the American military authorities, everyone knew this. Um, we had broken the Japanese code on September 25th, 1941. It was the diplomatic code, not the military code. So, although that would come a bit later on. The United States responded by freezing all Japanese assets. Great Britain and the Netherlands followed suit, and now Japan found itself in the fall of 1941, cut off from 90% of its oil supplies. If this situation weren't reversed, Japan would be reduced to impotence. A proposed meeting between heads of state, Japan and the United States, was rebuffed by the United States. Cordell Hall, the American uh, Secretary of State, was not interested in pursuing this, neither was Franklin Roosevelt, and the drift for war, toward war began to gather momentum. In early September, Japan decided to be fully prepared for war by the end of October. Then in October, Minister of War Tojo, the General Tojo, assumed power in Japan. Still, while Japan prepared for a drive to the south and possible war with the United States, the diplomatic traffic intensified. All through this, the fall of 1941, as the Japanese are pretty clear about what, what they want to do, that is, they know what their military strategy is going to be. And it's going to be to launch a major assault into Southeast Asia. It's going to bring it to, into war with France, Great Britain, um, Holland, and undoubtedly the United States. They st there's still the hope that somehow this can be negotiated, that, there, that some sort of diplomatic solution can be achieved. The Japanese offered withdrawal from Indochina and parts of China if the United States would not interfere in Sino-Japanese peace negotiations would agree, and would agree to normalize trade relations between the United States and Japan, and that the United States would support Japanese acquisi acquisition of the Dutch East Indies. This would give Japan its, its, the oil that it needed. It would, uh, the Japanese framed it in such a way that this would be the maximum set of demands. This would put limits on Japanese demands in, in Asia. Secretly, the Japanese government had set a deadline of November 25th for progress in the talks. The Roosevelt administration knew this. That is, while we were negotiating with the Japanese, the Cordell Hall, Franklin Roosevelt understood that November 25th was an important date for the Japanese. They didn't know exactly what this meant. They didn't know that this would automatically trigger an attack. It certainly didn't if it was going to trigger an attack, where that attack would come. But they understood that the diplomats, the Japanese diplomats in Washington had been given to understand that if nothing had happened, if no substantive progress had been made by November 25th, then a new situation, a radically new situation would apply. What everyone understood was that some sort of military action would be undertaken by Imperial Japan. 
This made it very difficult, I think, for the Roosevelt administration to negotiate in good faith. Everything that the Japanese seemed to be offering on the table was interpreted as being, well, they're not serious about this. They're, they're, they're really just setting us up. They're really planning uh, a military attack. And, of course, what it, it, it made the United States a lot less interested, I think, in negotiation. Although the United States military position was stunningly weak in the fall of 1941, staggeringly weak, astonishingly weak. Um, the Roosevelt administration rejected the Japanese proposals on November 26th and demanded outright Japanese withdrawal from China, period. Not only was this a breakdown of the negotiation, this was telling, this was, for, as far as the Japanese were concerned, an absolutely irresponsible slap in the face on the part of the Americans. On that same day, November 26, 1941, a large Japanese carrier force set sail in the northern Pacific. Its objective was the U.S. naval base at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii.